Okay, we're starting. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Bollin. In terms of announcements, this Friday I will be having a discussion with Stephen Murphy on whether early latter day Saint Christology was that of modalism, a la the thesis of Dan Vogel and Grant Palmer. So we'll be looking at the Book of Mormon and the 1832 account of the First Vision. Naturally, I will be taking the composition. I don't believe modalism is in the Book of Mormon or the early accounts of the First Vision. It's also going to be very good preparation for the debate I'll have with my friend Adam Oakes on this particular topic as well in the near future. Also, on August the 1st, we will have James Holt from the UK on to discuss the Latter-day Saint theology of world religions based on a dissertation he wrote a couple of years ago as well. Today's uh, guest comes all the way from Utah, as they usually tend to do, uh, my friend Jacob Vadrine. Uh, thank you for coming on, Jacob. It's good to be on. Uh, before we discuss what topic we'll be discussing today, um, how about you give us an introduction to yourself? Uh, who are you, where you live? Uh, and what your interests, and what got you interested in Mormon studies as well? So, my name is Jacob Bedrine. I have been interested in, in studying Mormon history for about, um, since about 2014. So, I, I guess I'd say I'm a younger person in Mormon studies. And for me, it was kind of wanting to dig deeper into the theology of the Restoration. And in order to do that, you kind of also have to dig into the history quite a bit to, to get into the, the history of it. Um, and so eventually, as you, as I started, you know, reading and studying and researching, I started, you know, finding, you know, having new ideas and new sources. And I eventually um, got, got to the point where I started giving presentations on different things. For example, I gave my first paper I ever did was on Jos New Light on Joseph Smith's Last Charge, which I gave in um, July of 2018. And then I gave a paper on the prophet, priest, and king ruler over Israel office that um, was in connection to the Council of 50. I gave that paper in July of 2019. And um, I've just had a lot of other things that I've researched and written, and I've I and when I gave my prophet, priest, and king paper, I, I I decided I would have a magazine where people could actually get my research in print form, and that magazine is called One Eternal Round, a magazine de dedicated to Mormon history and theology. And I guess to give a kind of context on my faith background, I am a fundamentalist, Latter Day Saint. I not affiliated with the FLDS or any big group like the AUB or you know any of those other big groups. I it would lean more towards an independent would be the, probably the better way to describe me. Based and affiliated with kind of the LeBaron Ross LeBaronite line of tradition. So that's kind of where my faith tradition is. But I love doing apologetic work and historical work, and that. Um, you know, I, I love interacting with people that I would guess you'd say are mainstream Latter Day, mainstream LDS, and um, you know, sharing ideas and discussing different aspects of Mormon history with them. So, yeah, and I'll include a link to your One Eternal Round magazine uh, as part of the show notes. Um, what are your main uh, areas or any specific areas that you're most interested in in Mormon history? If you had to pick um, maybe like I, your top favorite topics to research, you know. Um. Okay, that that's a good question. I, I would say I like things that relate to um, the the Mormon view on deity. I think that's a very fun area to research. I am also really big on um, priesthood and succession. I recently wrote a paper called "Succession to Brigham Young," that was I I think was trying to give a more updated defense of the transfiguration of Brigham Young as a historical event and also discussed a lesser known story about Brigham Young where they, the apostles, when they met to reorganize the first presidency actually felt like they had, uh, you know, that there was a revelation. The voice of the Lord came to them and they felt strongly impressed through the spirit to make that decision to have Brigham Young reorganize the first presidency. And that was in on December 5th, 1847. So yeah, I, I would say priesthood, succession, and um, deity are, are kind of my major topics of research. Yeah, and there are also topics I like to research as well. Uh, as you know, I've written a book on the priesthood. Uh, one of my topics, I love to discuss Christology and related topics. And 
Uh, although I've not gone into the same depth as you, and I do appreciate your volume on the succession of Brigham Young, and everyone should check it out. It's a very good uh, resource on the Transfiguration and other topics. I have written against uh, John Hajek, uh, a strand guide who, uh, I'll be glad to <laughs> quote mind the living heck out of the eternal discourses to somehow prove Brigham did not believe himself to be the successor. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen that, but um, it's... Oh, oh yeah, I, I have your book over there on my my shelf. I think it's really good. And I've actually had similar debates with that individual. I I appreciate um, his status as a collector. I don't appreciate his. Um, I I would all, I would classify it as um, you know po po polemic attacks against Brigham Young that aren't very historical or honest. So, and th yeah, that was he actually blocked me for that at one point over. Um, me responding to him saying some you know some bad things about Brigham Young and I was like well here's what William Smith actually wrote to Orson Hyde basically saying I have sinned against heaven and earth in slandering Brigham I know he's the Lord's anointed and and then he never responded after that so <laughs> yeah uh, I compare him to Dan Vogel very good at collecting documents but when it comes to interpreting it like uh, way out of his wheelhouse um <laughs> but uh yeah maybe we can actually have you on to discuss the succession issue as well um although we do have theological differences at least we both believe Brigham to be joseph's successor and um not strang so uh, that's always gonna be a fun interesting topic so today you topic, know what's it oh go ahead what what um you know there's there's actually a decent segue to the strangites and actually um the individual we're talking about and and he has actually written on the same topic that we are going to be discussing today I, I don't know if you're aware of, of that or not, but... A, a bit in passing, but um, today's topic, uh, I think uh, the very first time we interacted was actually on Facebook. You messaged me and you kind of, uh, uh, because I was biking a bit on like uh, this particular topic, although again, not in the same depth as you've done recently, uh, because not a lot of LDS writers have discussed this. Um, and this is the Joseph Smith's theology and teachings concerning the restoration of animal sacrifices in the future. Um, so, um, what kind of got you interested in this particular topic? Uh, I'll share what got me interested in this uh, after okay. this, but, um, th because this isn't exactly a topic that's been well discussed in a lot of circles, especially like mainstream LDS to which I belong to. So, um, yeah, I would, I would say what got me interested in it was actually reading through teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and seeing that there was actually a general conference address where Joseph Smith gave on the priesthood that actually said that um, animal sacrifice would eventually be part be practiced by Latter-day Saints in some, some capacity, he doesn't go into detail, as part of a fulfillment of the prophecies of the restoration of all things. And this was Joseph Smith's October 5th, 1840, general conference address and it's in the joseph smith papers um volume seven is where the original notes of this address and this is actually a very unique address by the prophet in that this is the only actual sermon we have from joseph smith that was written beforehand in that if you read the context of it he said he was work he was he was having he had other commitments at that time that he was working on and so he didn't have time to give this particular address in person but he said i will dictate it and then you guys can go read it at the conference and so it's the only sermon we have that joseph smith actually gave in advance and this instructions on priest is really good um i had a friend who was when he was working for the church historical department he he told me that he heard through the grapevine that there was even a uh, modern apostle of the church who thought that maybe this instructions on priesthood ought to be canonized, which I thought was interesting. I forgot the name of which apostle he had heard said that, but um, ne nevertheless, it's a very interesting and significant in that it's probably the only written sermon we have of Joseph Smith. Yeah, and we can so. definitely uh, discuss that um, and other topics as well momentarily. Uh, what got me interested in this, for those who are uh, curious, is uh, two or three things. Uh, one, trying to make sense of Ezekiel 40 to 48. Uh, for those who have not read Old Testament recently, uh, this is like Ezekiel's vision of a then future and still future temple where there's animal sacrifices and Levitical priests and all these things. And of course, it it's after the establishment of the new covenant. So they're like trying to make sense of it because how it's presented, it seems like it will be a literal temple with literal priests and literal animal sacrifices. So how do you square this 
very detailed prophecy and description of the temple and the sacrifices and the priesthood, with, of course, the traditional view that animal sacrifices are abolished. No qualifications, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You know, and also, um, you know, there's a chapter in the uh, Granddaddy book, uh, well, Mormonism and Veil, maybe the Granddaddy book, but like uh, the main evangelical book against Mormonism, Mormonism Shadow Reality, they have an entire chapter to Tanner's Old Testament Practices in Mormonism. Um, and one of the topics they bring up is Joseph Smith's teachings concerning animal sacrifice and so forth. You know, in their view, it contradicts not just Hebrews, but also even the Book of Mormon. We can discuss uh, some of these scriptural texts later as well. Yeah, third, third and, Nephi nine nine, right? Exactly, and some texts in Hebrews as well. And one other topic as well is I'm perhaps the only Latter Day Saint apologist who's interacted with, in any depth, and that's not me boasting; it's just like it's a fact. With the Christadelphians, a 19th century radical Unitarian Restorationist group, but their te uh, founders and their main theologians from their founding in 1840 onwards has taught that there will be a reestablishment of a temple. Levitical priests and animal sacrifices in the millennial age, like Henry Sully, a well-known UK uh, um, architect who actually wrote an entire book, The Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy, one of the most detailed 19th century treatments of this, and all over the uh, place they keep teaching there will be a reinstitution of animal sacrifice, informed by like premillennialism, which Latter Day Saints hold to as well, as well as other shared topics, although they would have like they reject, like, say, an ordained new covenant priest and the other things. So this wasn't, like, a novelty with Joseph Smith in some respects, you know. And, of course, modern evangelicals, some of them who are premillennialists, i.e. those who believe in the literal 1,000-year millennium before Christ comes, well, before the final judgment, um, Christ comes, and that inaugurates a literal 1,000-year millennium, if you will, um, that there will be this reestablishment of some type of animal sacrifices, even if it's only symbolic and not efficacious or expiatory and so forth. So that kind of got me interested as well, as well as like looking at Joseph Smith's own teachings and stuff like that. And I kind of found like a lot of traditional LDS apologetic responses to be um, well-meaning, but rather naive on these particular issues. Like uh, I, I even have one who I have great respect for, I'm not going to name names, uh, but they basically argued, well, Joseph was commenting on Malachi and Malachi uses Menka in Hebrew and that could refer to a gift offering. So Joseph is not talking about animal sacrifices. He's talking about gift offerings uh, in section 13 of the Doctrine and Covenants, as well as trying to transpose that into his other teachings as well. So um, trying to, in my own blog, uh, Scriptural Mormonism, trying to add to the conversation and um, show that mm, there's a better way to approach these things. So mm -hmm. uh, that that's where I initially come from anyway. Yeah. And, and so I, I would say that, you know, what got me even more interested is really there isn't just one Joseph Smith statement. There's actually several different statements. There's some verses in the DNC. There's um, statements by Brigham Young and some other of the early brethren. And I, I'd say it actually continues up in that you have later church presidents and apostles continue to acknowledge, even though they say we don't really understand when this will happen or what the extent will be. So, but acknowledging that this would be part of the restoration of all things. And then, like you said, there's just a ton of different things in the Old Testament that would imply or indicate that there would be some form of animal sacrifice in the premillennial or millennium, according to, um, you know, different, you have Ezekiel, obviously, is the most in-depth, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Zechar Zechariah, so it's it's in quite a few places. So, yeah, and we can definitely discuss these scriptural objections and scriptural evidences momentarily, um, both biblical and uniquely Latter Day Saints as well. So, maybe a good place to start would be Joseph. You've alluded to it, Joseph's uh, sermon from October of eighteen forty. So, uh, you mentioned like just these uh, the rare sermon where Joseph actually dictated before he gave it, and it was actually disseminated. It wasn't like um, he went off the stand and gave it, you know, so of course, like, because he dictated beforehand, you know, and so forth, this was something he did take very seriously. It wasn't like an off-the-cuff type of thing. Uh, what exactly did he teach with respect to animal sacrifice in this particular sermon? So, it's a good sermon. He, he says, 
he, he quotes from Malachi 3.3, 3, if you were, as you mentioned, and he goes, it will be necessary here to make a few observations on the doctrine set forth in the above quotation. It is generally supposed that the sacrifice was entirely done away with in the great sacrifice. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus was offered up, and there will be no necessity for the ordinance of sacrifice in the future. But those who assert this are certainly not acquainted with the duties, privileges, and authority of the priesthood, or with the prophets. The authority the offering of sacrifice has ever been connected and forms a part of the duties of the priesthood. It began with the priesthood and will continue until after the coming of Christ from generation to generation. We frequently have mention made of the offering of sacrifice by servants of the Most High in ancient, of day, in ancient days, prior to the law of Moses, which ordinances will be continued when the priesthood is restored with all its authority, powers, and blessing. Elijah was the last prophet that held the keys of of the priesthood and who will before the last dispensation restore the authority and deliver the keys of the priesthood in order that all ordinances may be attended to in righteousness. And this just a comment on that. Joseph Smith throughout the Nauvoo period spoke of the restoration of Elijah as a futuristic thing because the restoration in the Kirtland temple DNC 110 was not publicly known about. And I think the book of Abraham project website notes on this sermon that there's no public reference explaining DNC 110 during the prophet's lifetime. Even though it's written in his journal the day it occurs, it is copied in the history of the church before his death, um, but it's the apostles after Joseph Smith died who, who start talking about that Elijah had already come and delivered up the keys and that Joseph had conferred those keys on them. So... And and just so that there will be any confusion, you're not you're not following Denver Snuffer who claims this was like a, a fabrication. You're just saying like the commentary on it comes later, but the event did happen. Just yeah, like, yeah. So so that's actually what I'm directly responding to because there are people like Denver Snuffer who will try to say that Joseph spoke futuristically, so DNC one ten didn't really happen, even though it's it, it was written by the by the prophet scribe in his journal. You know, it was a. Kirtland era scribe who apostatized. There's no, it, it, there's no way that that was a later fabrication by Brigham Young, as Denver Snuffer might. Oh no, imply. I just, thought, I just thought I mentioned that just in case someone might think uh, you're going through the Denver Snuffer line. No, you're just saying like the commentary on this comes after Joseph, but it did have happened, and it's not like say a later insertion in Joseph Smith's history. Yes, That's exactly. Right. Yeah. Cool. So. It is true that the Savior had authority and power to, to bestow this blessing, but the sons of Levi were too prejudiced. And I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord, etc., etc. Why send Elijah? Because he holds the keys of authority to administer in all the ordinances of the priesthood. And without the authority given, the ordinances could not be administered in righteousness. It is a very prevalent opinion that the sacrifices which were offered were entirely consumed. This was not the case. If you read Leviticus 2, Verses 2 through 3, you will observe that the priest took a part as a memorial and offered it up before the Lord while the remainder was kept for the maintenance of the priests, so that the offerings and sacrifices are not all consumed upon the altar, but the blood is sprinkled and the fat and certain other portions are consumed. These sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priesthood, will, when the temple of the Lord shall be built and the sons of Levi be purified, be fully restored and attended to in all their powers, ramifications, and blessings. This ever did and ever will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priests are sufficiently manifest. Else how can the restitution of all things spoken of by the holy prophets be brought, about, brought to pass? It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rites and variety of ceremonies. This has never been spoken of by the prophets. But those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely sacrifice, will be continued. It may be asked by some what necessity for sacrifice since the great sacrifice was offered, in answer to which, if repentance, baptism, and faith existed prior to the days of Christ, what necessity for them since that time? The priesthood has descended a regular line from father to son through their succeeding generations. See Book of Doctrine and Covenants. And that, that's unfortunately how it ends. He he's, begins to get into, so so what's the purpose of this? How does this fit with the atonement of Christ? And then, unfortunately, the sermon ends right at that point. And um, there, there's other sermons where Joseph says, I will speak on this more at a later time. But unfortunately, he, he never did. So this is one of those instances. 
Well, so. we can definitely discuss, like, say, how it relates to the atonement after this. But even from, like, say, that reading of those particular passages that you shared with us, it does seem like you can't spiritualize away the sacrifices uh, Joseph is speaking about. Um, as I've said, like, I've come across, like, one or two LDS apologists. You know, and I'm actually an LDS apologist myself, so, like, uh, you know, I, do, I would consider myself a bit mainstream. Um at the same time, like, they do try to argue, like, uh, well, these are about spiritual sacrifices, not actual sac literal sacrifices, you know, or they try to spiritualize it, like, I think maybe as a knee-jerk reaction against, like, say, Hebrews and other texts that speak of, um, you know, how Christ's atonement uh, nullifies the law of Moses. But even Joseph here teaches, one, it's not a reinstitution of the law of Moses. You know, that for him, that's been abrogated, you know. But mm -hmm. it seems like when it comes to, say, polygamy and other teachings as part of the restitution of all teens, the restoration of all teens, uh, something he discusses in section 128, verse 18, for Joseph, it was of necessity that, like, all the um, doc practices and so forth, you know, um, of previous dispensations that have not been abrogated, like the law of Moses, would in some way or another, even for a short period of time, be restored or practiced, even as a once-off. Um, as part of a, a fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, as part of like a fulfillment of prophecy is the big reason, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I know that I know some like Brian Hales has offered that as one potential reason for like why plural marriage was practiced by Joseph as part of rest, restoration of like, um, because of course, plural marriage is actually something that's pre-Mosaic covenant as well, as well as animal sacrifices, you know, uh, animal sacrifices precedes. Uh, for instance, in Abraham 12, after Abraham was initially justified, he offer, he builds an altar and he offers up a sacrifice to God. That's clearly not a spiritual sacrifice, a prayer or thanksgiving, it's something much more. And that seems to be, so Joseph is speaking about physical, not spiritual, only sacrifices in this sermon. Uh, I think we can both agree that's, y y you're doing injustice if you argue otherwise. I, I can see how someone might want to take this one ser If this sermon was the only thing, then I could see how someone could try that apologetics. But the the, the problem with that, you know, trying to overly spiritualize Joseph Smith's teachings here is that there are other statements and there are other quotations that are more direct. Some of them are from, you know, people remembering what they heard Joseph Smith told them or taught. But, you know, others of them are, you know, so some of them are in contemporary sources like this one. I think that it's kind of hard to do it to argue it's a, only a spiritual sacrifice. But so just just as one example, Oliver B. Huntington, and this is in the book. Um, they knew the prophet when he he recalled that Joseph. He asked Joseph, "Will there ever be any offerings of sheep and heifers and bullocks upon altars as used to be required of Israel?" And that Joseph replied, yes, there will be, for there never was any right ordinance or law in the priesthood of any gospel dispensation on this earth, but will have to be finished and perfected in this, the last dispensation of time, the dispensation of all dispensations. And there are, you know, a number of other statements about that. Um, I, I think Brigham Young made a number of statements. For example, when they got the Nauvoo Temple completed, um, and, and this was only completed enough for them to be able to do the endowment ordinances. They didn't actually um, have the bottom floors really finished, you know, to the way they, they wanted them to be. If it would have been you know, ideal not having to flee uh, Nauvoo. So he, but this is in the Nauvoo temple. He said, when we get a temple built right, there will be a place for the priests to enter and put on their robes and offer up sacrifices first for themselves and then for the people. And um, at winter quarters, Newell K. Whitney taught, we are now in the dispensation of the fullness of times that every ordinance or office that has been practiced in the church of former days will be revived in this dispensation, even to the offering of sacrifice. So th there's a number of examples like that where um, th they, this is something that was known and was, was talked about. And there's even some um, antagonistic sources like John C. Bennett wanted to try to say, you know, so he, he wanted to, or he tried to say that Joseph was doing animal sacrifices in Nauvoo. I don't think Bennett is credible on that. And the church newspaper thought he, um, the Nauvoo wasp kind of responded to that and saying, oh yeah, and you were this great, you know, it, 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 he's apparently mocking it while alleging that he was involved with it. And so like, can you imagine John C. Bennett wearing a, priest robe and slaying an animal they're, you know so they're like <laughs> so so it would be fair to say like how joseph was interpreted by like both critic and uh friend 
um, they did understand it to be not purely spiritual sacrifices, but to be literal physical sacrifices in a future age. Yes. And is that something that's held by like um, most or all groups when the broad Mormon restorationist perspective, or is this kind of unique or emphasized, at least his historically, by like say the Brighamites, quote unquote, and those who may descend from that particular lineage? Um, I think Brighamites, insofar as I think Brigham Young was the one who did the most to try to perpetuate everything Joseph Smith taught. So they obviously were the most. The thing that one thing I cover in my so I did two papers on this: um, the the restoration of Adamic ordinances, part one, which goes into the theology of it, and I did uh, restoration of Adamic ordinances, part two, which goes into the history of it. And maybe I did that backwards. Maybe I should have talked about the history first before the theology, but I was more interested in addressing the theology at the time. And in the history part, I actually addressed that the Strangites, interestingly, were also proponents of animal sacrifice. And they had a very interesting theological setup where they were very monarchian, where James Strang literally had a coronation with a crown placed on his head and you know, to be king. And when they did that, they felt that that should be a honored day. And so they decided that, according to Strang, that they should do memorial sacrifices on the anniversary of that day. And it was in July. I'm not going to guess which day in July, maybe July 6th. Um, but anyhow, so they started with memorial offerings. And I would argue that that what they did with animal sacrifice was based off of this broader understanding of Joseph Smith teaching it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, also, I'm not sure if it's all strand guides, but many of them are like also uh, Seventh Day Sabbatarians and the very, very Old Testament and every night feel to some of their theology as well. But that's a different kettle of fish. But yeah, Th that, that's that's a good point that they also were very Old Testament in the you know being doing a Saturday Sabbath. And so we were talking, we mentioned um, John Hadjikak, who is a person who identifies with that line of authority. Um, he actually, on one of his websites, I think it's strangite.org, uh, has an article on animal sacrifice, basically arguing with a bunch of different scriptures from the New Testament for that. So I, I thought it was at least a very creative article. So, Okay, well, I'm sure like some will say, well, maybe Joseph did teach like animal sacrifice, but like don't the scriptures, both the Bible and uniquely Latter-day Saint scripture, like the Book of Mormon, actually teach that with the atonement of Christ, which I hope everyone believes in, you know, in the resurrection of Christ and his high priestly intercession, um, the law of Moses was abrogated, and with that, among other things, of course, like animal sacrifices, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, were done and dusted, um, and not just like mosaic sacrifices, but like even pre-mosaic sacrifices, they're not efficacious and they're never to be offered again. For instance, uh, there's many passages in Hebrews that speaks of how Christ abrogates the old law and many, you know, all throughout, uh, such as Hebrews chapter 10, for instance. But there's also Turn Nephi 9.9 in the uh, Book of Mormon. Um, I'm not sure if you have that memorized. If not, I'll just open it up here. But this is okay. the uh, resurrected Christ, you know, who appears in the new world. Um, hashtag Mesoamerica. Uh, <laughs> not to Heartland, at least let's agree on that. But um, this is what he says. Um, and behold, uh, yeah, is it 9 9? Uh -huh. You want me to pull out my Book of Mormon here? <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> I, think it's it's... I think it's Turn Nephi 9 9, is it? Oh, 919. No, 919. I don't know why we're... Yeah. 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 Um, and ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away, for I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. So that's... So there seems to be, like, very strong, not just implicit, but, like, explicit teachings in uniquely the Day Saint Scripture, as well as the Bible, that annual sacrifices will never be practiced again with the death and resurrection of Christ. So, and, and, and another another verse that's commonly cited is Alma 34, verse 13. Therefore, it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, and then there should be or 
And then shall there be, or is expedient, there should be a stop to the shedding of blood. Then shall the law of Moses be fulfilled. Yea, it shall be all it shall be all fulfilled, every jot and tittle, and none shall have passed away. Yeah. So, so you've got. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. So so you got some strong verses here, and you also have, as you mentioned in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, these strong verses. And that's why I feel like I really wish Joseph could have given a part two sermon on this, because that's the very last paragraph of that sermon is people will say, how does this fit with the atonement of Christ? And he basically says, well, we know the ordinances, you know, we there is baptism and repentance before, you know, Christ came. So, what, you know, we still need those things after Christ came. So, he didn't really give like a deep, detailed theological answer to it. And so, there are different ways of looking at it. One of the most common ways is to say that the old, that, so in 3 Nephi 9.19, it says that there will be no more sin offerings or burn offerings. And so, some think that maybe it's only meaning that certain types of animal sacrifices were completely abolished and that say, if you have a uh, peace offering or a memorial offering, I understand that those could be animal sacrifices as well, that those could be different forms that could continue hypothetically, while the ending of the shedding of blood was mainly referring to sin offerings and burnt offerings. But when, if you get into Ezekiel, the problem with that and interpretation with the Ezekiel's temple is Ezekiel's temple describes all sorts of of a trespass offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, you name it. It's got all the different types going on in that temple. One thing that is interesting about Ezekiel's temple to argue for the millennial aspect of it, as I understand that it only, in the Mosaic system, there was sacrifices twice a day in the temple. The Ezekiel's temple only describes, I believe, a morning sacrifice instead of a morning and an evening sacrifice. So in at least some limited regard, Ezekiel is saying that this will not be as widespread amount of animal sacrifice as was done previ in previous temples. Um, and so, so, but how do you reconcile with the references to sin offerings and burnt offerings being offered in this prophecy? And I believe... I believe Jeremiah and Isaiah also speak of those off specific offerings. And so you can look at those offerings being restored in a symbolic sense as definitely probably a, uh, as a way to fulfill prophecy in, and not in an efficacious sense, I would say, is one, one perspective on it. Um, the other perspective that I personally argue in my paper is I think that when Christ came, he su suspended those ordinances, but that he can also reinstitute those ordinances as he saw fit to reinstitute. For example, like you could say with the history of plural marriage, where at times it can be suspended and not be practiced, at times it can be commanded. And so that's the analogy I would use and um, is, is to the fact that we have different ordinances that can be suspended at different times based off of, and. Another example, I think Joseph Smith mentioned this once, is that the practice of circumcision was suspended by the Israelites while they were in the 40 years in the wilderness. And it wasn't until a certain, you know, that they were out of the wilderness that they actually resumed that ordinance, if, I under, if I'm remembering that story correctly. And so th there are other examples in, in the scriptures of ordinances being suspended for a period of time. And I think that obviously Christ suspending the ordinances he did was to emphasize that ultimately the, 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 the Jews, at least in the old world had become so focused on the law as the medium of salvation. That's what Paul is arguing about contextually. Paul's not arguing against good works in the new Testament being efficacious for salvation. He's arguing against people are looking at all these rituals in the law of Moses and saying that those are how you're being saved and Paul said, you know, I, he had he had very strong language to say these were not your medium of salvation. It's Christ that ultimately is the thing that this was supposed to be pointing you to. And even so, for Judaizers, like I kind of wish they don't just circumcise the foreskin, kind of circumcise the entire member just to shut them up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in Galatians, there it's um, it's in the King James is it's obscured, but in other translations, it's more direct. Where he says, "I wish they would just cut them, you know, emasculate themselves." So. Yeah, because Paul, of course, was not against good works, at least done 
you know, in the auspices of God's grace. Like he even teaches baptismal regeneration in chapter six of Romans for crying out loud. You know, it's as you know, like um, a belief that the law of Moses was the instrumental means of salvation. You know, something the Book of Mormon also condemns explicitly in a Benedict's uh, sermon to uh, King Noah's priests. But yeah, that's correct. So in your view, um, it, it, there might be like symbolism associated with these future animal sacrifices, but in some way with respect to sin and atonement, they could be in some sense efficacious or will be efficacious once they're reinstituted or inaugurated again. Yeah, that, that's, you know, and, and it all depends on ultimately what, um, how long they were supposed to be reinstituted for. I think Joseph Fielding Smith had the opinion that maybe it would be a one-off. So, so what I think Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie in their writings tried to what they suggest is maybe when the Jews build this third temple, you know, the, you know this this Jerusalem temple, when they build a new temple in Jerusalem, then there will be them doing these things as a fulfillment shortly before, and, and that it will be a one-off thing and be done. And there, there, but you know, from Joseph Smith's statement, I think maybe he was saying from it would continue from generation to generation. So, I, I think there are different schools of thought on how widespread it would. It would be practice if that makes sense. I do think what's interesting is it's talked about um, in by the early Latter Day Saints in early Utah um, in the 1840s and 1850s a bit more strongly than later on. So Brigham Young in January of 1847 made a comment. He says, "When I get everything raked out in the valley, we'll have a jubilee and make a burnt offering." And that's an interesting statement. I've n I have no record or evidence of them actually doing a burnt offering. Um, but when they were talking about building the Salt Lake Temple, they even talked about it again. This was in the 1857 when he made this comment, December of 1857. He, said, he says, when the temple is finished and a place duly prepared, we should not be confined to any particular number in ceilings or anointings. The room next to the east pulpit or over it will be the place to attend to the second anointing. Under the pulpit in the west end will be the place to offer sacrifices. There will be an altar prepared for that purpose so that when any sacrifices are to be offered, they should be offered there. And that's in Wilford Woodruff's journal, December 18th, 1857. So that's a very interesting comment that, I, and I don't think, I, I'm, I'm, other researchers have said that they actually didn't ever follow through with that and preparing a room for animal sacrifices in the Salt Lake Temple. Um, I know some people speculated maybe there was supposed to be them in the Nauvoo Temple because um, the Nauvoo Temple Revelation made a long list of ordinances that were that were that were intended to be performed in that temple, and that's uh, DNC one twenty four thirty nine. Therefore, verily I say unto you that your anointings and your washings and your baptisms for the dead and your solemn assemblies and your memorials for your sacrifices by the sons of Levi and for your oracles in the most holy places wherein you receive conversations and your statutes and judgments, et cetera, et cetera. So they're talking about it as, you know, they're thinking maybe we'll actually build a temple and, and perform these ordinances. But um, as far as I'm seeing the historical record, there is no strong evidence of them ever performing animal sacrifices in the temples, except there is one comment. Wandel Mace seemed to think that there was uh, a memorial, uh, a special sacrifice offered by the 12 under Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon's direction in the Kirtland Temple. And this would have been and, this, and he said the circumstance was they were preparing to ordain Willard Richards to the apostleship in England, and they they wouldn't have a full quorum of the twelve to do that ordination. And so he said we're we're going to do this as a preparation to that. But that's a very late recollection, and there's no other corroborating witness to it. So you got to be cautious with a source that's late and you have no secondary witness to it, in my opinion. But, you know, what's interesting is by the 1870s in the School of the Prophets, Orson Pratt made a comment where they were talking about somebody asked whether they should, whether animal sacrifices were going to start to be performed. And Orson Pratt didn't seem to think that they were going to do it. He said, sacrifices were instituted by the Almighty many generations before the crucifixion of the Savior. And since the time the sacrament of bread and wine was substituted, there are many ways of sacrifices, excuse me. There are many ways of sacrifices besides the shedding of blood. We may sacrifice property and other things for the sake of building up the kingdom of God. 
Though from many passages in the Old Testament, I am inclined to believe that the children of Israel will in the last days be required to offer up sacrifices as in days of old. And then Daniel H. Wells agreed, saying, I expect the Jews will be gathered again in unbelief to rebuild Jerusalem and offer sacrifices as in days of old. So for them, they were trying to thinking that maybe this would be more of the Jews in Jerusalem will be the ones to do it. In contrast to the earlier statements that thought, you know, maybe Latter-day Saints would be the ones to do it. Yeah. Um, so, of course, like a question, there's two questions that will come up. Um, the scriptural basis for this and also how does this jive with common theories of the atonement so um maybe if we were to discuss the scriptural basis first and then we can segue into the atonement because you do discuss the atonement um as well as in your work um okay. we, mentioned, we mentioned ezekiel uh, let me actually uh quote a protestant scholar uh who's a pre millennialist this is in an article the problem of animal sacrifices in ezekiel 40 to 48 in biblioteca sacra which is a mainstream evangelical publication uh, from 1995, a Jerry W. Hollinger wrote the following, and he's trying to wrestle with like Ezekiel's very literal language in these chapters, 40 to 48, the atonement of Christ, and what's how to balance these things out, or uh, trying to make sense of it in light of a present premillennial perspective. And he basically writes the following: Ezekiel, this is part of his conclusion. Ezekiel 40 to 48 indicates that during the millennium, God's glory will return to the temple where sacrificial ritual will take place and which offerings will make atonement. For Ezekiel, the concept of atonement is the same as it was in the book of Leviticus, namely an act that wipes away and purges uncleanliness. The purgation will be required because the divine presence will once again be dwelling in the land. As argued earlier in his article, impurity is contagious to both persons and sancta. Further, impurity is inimicable to Yahweh, who refuses to dwell among the people if uncleanness remains untreated. Because of God's promises to dwell on earth during the millennium, as stated in the New Covenant, it is necessary that he protect his presence through sacrifice. This function of sacrifice, according to the book of Hebrews, is efficacious. However, this was never the purpose of Christ's sacrifice, for it dealt with the internal cleansing of the conscience. Therefore, the two are harmonious. It should be further added that this sacrificial system will be a temporary one in the millennium, with its partial population of unglorified humanity, and will last only 1,000 years. During the eternal stage, all inhabitants of the new Jerusalem will be glorified, and will therefore not be a source of contagious impurities to defile the holiness of Yahweh. So I do find it very interesting, and there's many others, but like this is a mainstream uh, evangelical Protestant publication from the uh, 1995, basically arguing you have to take Ezekiel literally. You could try to spiritualize it a bit, you can try to find allegory, uh, but at the same time, it's a literal prophecy. It will have to take place uh, in the future, and these are sacrifices. So he tries to wrestle with like what are the nature of these sacrifices, and you have to give credit to him, like he's not willing to like. Um, throw out like a literal interpretation just because it's uneasy um he basically admits yeah these are sacrifices and they deal with the external cleansing of contagion not necessarily the internal that only christ can do but the external contagion of sin and uncleanness mm -hmm. in the millennial age so yeah that's really good and when we begin to talk about you know atonement theology and in understanding um, the theology of sin offerings, or how to under, how, how to look at them. I I I have a, a Jewish individual who's done a lot of study on um, a Messianic Jewish individual who's done a lot of work on trying to study both animal sacrifice and how that fits with the atonement. Who also very much agrees with that scholar's interpretation of it. So, apart from so that apart was Ezekiel. What are the other texts that you yourself would think are um, pints to you, whether implicitly or explicitly, of the uh, this, con this teaching of Joseph Smith? So what's interesting is Isaiah talks about it quite a bit, especially in the later parts, which are kind of more in um, premillennial or close or or millennial texts. Uh, so starting with just a couple verses, Isaiah fifty six verse seven, even then. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that's, um, you know, that that's interesting. It's talking about all people coming to the house of the Lord and not just the Lord's chosen people. So Isaiah 67 continues, All the flocks of cedar shall be gathered together unto thee, and the rabs of 
Neboeth shall minister unto thee, and they shall come with acceptance, and they shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Isaiah 66, 20. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering of, unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and in le leaders and upon mules and upon swift beasts and to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in clean vessels into the house of the Lord. Then the... Oh, cool. You got a bit of a PowerPoint here? Yeah. Great. Yeah, and so 20, the next verse, 66, 21, talks about Isaiah foreseeing the service of the temple going to all people and not just upon, to Levites, if you want to talk about that real quick. Yeah, um, well, this is about 56, 6 or 7, just like uh, to buttress what Jacob just said. Um, this, the following is actually from uh, Thomas Lane. Um, in the Synoptic Accounts of the Temple Cleansing in Matthew 21, 13, Mark eleven seventeen, and Luke 1946. Christ refers to God's house as being a house of prayer. That reference to house of prayer occurs in Isaiah 56, 6 to 7 that Jacob just uh, referenced and read from, where the prophet, third Isaiah as we commonly call him, although there was only one Isaiah, uh, unity of Isaiah, um, <laughs> foresaw major changes in the temple liturgy in the future. Changes so major that Levitical priests would not only would not be the only ones adding sacrifices. In Isaiah 56, 6 to 7, God announces through the prophet that foreigners, Gentiles, will offer burnt offerings and sacrifices in his holy mountain, where the Jerusalem temple is located, and that God will accept them on his altar. This is looking beyond priesthood confined to the tribe of Levi. It is something uh, for looking forward to something major happening in the future that will involve a massive change in the temple liturgy and the Levitical priesthood. The shock in Isaiah 56, 6 to 7 is its prediction that foreigners or Gentiles will come to minister in the temple because the word used for minister serving 56.6, sharash, typically refers to liturgical service. You know, it's not simply like, uh, you know, ha ministering to like, um, you know, in a neighborly way, like helping with the law and it's actually temple service here. Um, typically refers to liturgical service. The prophet sees Gentiles offering sacrifices in Jerusalem. This, i.e. Sharat, is omitted from Isaiah 56 in the Dead Sea Scrolls because perhaps this was uh, this idea was so repugnant. The Essene community was very like isolationist and separatist, uh, if you're familiar with them. It is highly suggestive that as Christ cleanses the temple, he quotes part of a scripture passage referring to foreigners undertaking priestly sacrificial duties in the temple. Uh, I remember reading this like a few years ago when this book came out. It's like, holy crap, this is awesome, you know, because it, it supports LDS theology on so many levels. Like, uh, non, non, non Gentiles being part of the Levitical priesthood, offering sacrifices in the eschaton. But um, the verb used here is shirat, according to the theological dictionary of the, um, according to Shalom and Paul first, uh, in his commentary on Isaiah 40 to 66. Uh, the ver for the verb shirat to know in temple service, see Exodus 29. 30 and Isaiah 61 6. For foreigners in the capacity of Levitical priests, see 66 21, uh, another Isaiah text that's quoted from to support this. And in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, a 15 volume set now, um, the theology of Trito Isaiah includes the universal expectation that God will integrate all the peoples of the earth into his kingdom and even choose priests and Levites from among them, i.e., the Gentiles, without legitimation, uh, legitimation of priestly descent. Therefore, Trito Isaiah includes foreigners, kings, Isaiah 56, 66, and 10, among God's future Sharat servants. And they can even become priests of the congregation. Their, this latter possibility is clear from the language of verse 6, which implies the usual marks of priestly uh, service. And under servants or Sharat of the cult, in the late period, Sharat is always associated with cultic sphere. Both priests and much more commonly Levites are referred to as Sharat servants. And... This is the uh, Masoretic text. Uh, as you can see here, it has the verb shirat, um, and this is from the Latin guide Crodex from 1008, but it's actually missing as no by lane in the Qumran text. Um, this is where it should be if you see the red square, but it's missing. And this is, again, the BHS and the uh, Lexham Dead Sea Scrolls for textual critical n nerds. And it's also in the Septuagint, right? So this is a place is. where... The Septuagint and the Masoretic texts agree, but the Dead Sea Scrolls do not have it, and so so you, it, well, you, you it seems to be like a deliberate omission uh, by the Essenes because um, 
they were, as I said, like very isolationists. Um, they were gun ho even more gun ho than the Pharisees when it comes to the law. They were separatists. Um, so they had like say foreigners or Gentiles, you know, who they saw as contaminated, ever becoming part of God's people, offering sacrifice. It, it would be sacrilege to the nth degree. So um, yeah. Yeah, so, so they have a good motive. Uh, I mean, you, you can understand their motive, why they would omit that that shocking statement about taking Gentiles for priests and for Levites. Yeah. And so uh, that's a great Bible commentary. And also the Cambridge Bible for uh, commentary for schools and colleges also similarly agreed on that verse. And it said that even the... Um, it, um, th th they basically said even the most moderate interpretation of this um, future temple described in Third Isaiah is that all of Israel will be participating in the priestly se sense and not just Levites. And that's the most moderate take, but they say that it's a lot more arguable that it's referring to even Gentiles serving in a priestly capacity in this temple. And the ramifications for this is like immense uh, because it shows like in the future, from Isaiah's perspective, Gentiles would be part of this Levitical cult. They would be offering sacrifice. They would hold a priesthood. And the ramifications for Latter-day Saint theology, like the perpetual nature of the Aaronic priesthood, it wasn't abrogated as some claim it was, as well as like um, there being a new coffin priesthood and other things, uh, some of which I've written about as well. Um, you know, you basically have to, uh, albeit implicitly claim Isaiah was a false prophet, if you want to, like, uh, jettison, like, he's really explicit teachings in 56 and 66, as well as other prophets in the Old Testament. Yeah. So, we, we already talked about Ezekiel's temple. Do we want to go into more detail with that, or do you oh, think... Oh, if you wish to go, if you wish to add a few more things, uh, I'll let you have that. Um, I'm, I'm just... You know, there's a ton of verses like you that, like you said, there's like seven seven chapters that just yeah, go into um, so before much. Before you do, let me actually recommend a book, uh, and this is actually on archive.org, but it's Henry Sully. Uh, his book from the 1890s, The Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy. Now, Sully himself was a British architect, and he was a Christadelphian, um, okay. which is a uh, restorationist group, not a Mormon restorationist group, like an American UK restorationist group, radically Unitarian. They don't even believe in the supernatural evil. But they, they're premillennialists, and uh, I would rather deal with 10 Jehovah's Witnesses than a single uh, normie Christadelphian. They're actually that very smart when it comes to uh, scripture. Um, and uh, just a shout out for an episode, I actually had one of their leading apologists, uh, Dave Burke, on to give an overview okay. of theology in April uh, of this year. Uh, he, he also debated Rob Bowman uh, on the Trinity uh, back in 2010. A debate Rob Bowman is um, probably wants to forget, but he will never forget. He did that bad. But be that as may, um, they're pretty millennialist and they've written a lot about pre millennialism. And this book is basically like an architect giving you the overview and structure of Ezekiel's temple so you can actually visualize it. But at the same time, okay. it discusses the pre millennial re reinstitution of sacrifice and so forth. So it's a very good book if you want to like try to visualize what Ezekiel's temple is about relationship of the altars to one another and all those details he puts in um because it can be pretty confusing if you just read the uh, chapters uh without like taking notes and so forth he does a very good job and of course as i mentioned he was an architect as well but he also discusses the theology as well and he comes to a very similar theology and theological conclusions as those who have studied this from a restorationist perspective a mormon restorationist perspective would come to you as well but independent of encountering the okay. sense. so i thought that was a rather interesting thing so yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm I'm not sure I, I want to just reread when you know if people really want to dig into Ezekiel's temple. There's some really great material out there on it, but you know Ezekiel. Besides Ezekiel's chapter forty through forty six and forty, yeah, and forty seven, I think touches on it a bit more, and a couple other places. Ezekiel twenty verse forty is another verse in Ezekiel that references where it talks about this in for in my holy mountain in the mountain of the height of israel saith the lord god there shall all the house of israel all of them in the land serve me and there will i accept them and i will and, and there will i require your offerings and the first fruit of your oblations and all your holy things and um the 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 niv and other translate some other translations translate holy things as in holy sacrifices so it's kind of not Maybe there's a variant in that verse. I'm not sure, or if that's the 
correct way of, in, in, of interpreting it. But like I said, it's just all over Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, talking about in very great detail the sacrifices in this um, temp, future temple. And um, in 47, Ezekiel is shown waters flowing through the temple, and the temple is situated on a high mountain. These waters were great enough to become a mighty river and um, and and would heal the Dead Sea. And so Ezekiel 47, verse 8, Then he said unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And then what's interesting is that is also talked about by Zechariah in Zechariah 14, 8. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea, and summer and winter shall it be. And so Joseph Smith commented on that verse on April 6, 1843, as one of the events to occur before the second coming of Christ. And he said, quote, Judah must return, Jerusalem must be rebuilt, and the temple and waters come out from under the temple, and the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. It will take some while, time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple, etc., and all this must be done before the Son of Man will make his appearance. And so that's in, yeah, yeah that was April 6, 1843. So Joseph Smith is very familiar with the different passages to support this. And, you know, I think Malachi 3.3 3 was the one that he would quote most often, mostly because of, he, he liked quoting Malachi because of Elijah returning in connection with the restoration of all things. But there, there are a couple other prophets like Jeremiah. I think you've, you've made posts about this one. Jeremiah 33 verse 15 it says in those days and at that time will i cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto david and he shall execute judge, judgment and righteousness in the land in those days shall judah be saved and jerusalem shall dwell safely and this is the name whereth she shall be called the lord of righteousness then going on for thus saith the lord david shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of israel neither shall the priests the levites want a man before me to offer burnt offerings to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifices continually. And that is a very clear statement about this Latter-day um, temple having these ordinances. And Zechariah goes into it also in the last chapter of Zechariah, verse chapter 14. He says, yeah, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be called holiness, and all they that sac sacrifice shall come and take therein and see therein. So it's... There's a lot of different verses out there to kind of support this. And, and many of them are dealing with what we would all agree upon would be eschatological days and times prophecy, like the Zechariah 14 text um, and others. Not simply those that were completely fulfilled with the first advent or coming of Christ. Yep, exactly. And if you want to get into Latter-day Saint scripture just really quickly, there's a number of places in the Doctrine and Covenants that also referred to this being restored. So like when um, John the Baptist came and restored the Aaronic priesthood, he said, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the mystery of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. And um, Oliver Cowdery's recollection of those so that was joseph from i believe that was taken from joseph smith's history oliver cowdery's earlier history recording the recalling those words said that john recalled john the baptist saying which shall remain on the earth that the sons of levi may yet offering an offering unto the lord in righteousness and then section 84 is another verse place that talks about this a bit where it says you know there there's the sons of moses and also the son Therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of, Lord, of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation upon the consecrated spot I have appointed. And you can obviously get into a big long discussion about the contingent nature of prophecy in when, when these things would be fulfilled is ultimately, you know, if you believe in... Um, what what what, what I, I'm losing the term off the top of my head about the idea that all prophecy is contingent and that it can't override free 
What was that? Open theism. Open theism. That's the term. I was like, I had it. I know what I'm talking. I know what it is. if you if you come from an open theist perspective, as both of us are, are very friendly with that view. <laughs> and for those who want a discussion of open theism, uh, the very first episode of this uh, podcast uh, with Blake Oster, we had a uh, sixty-minute discussion about open theism, and I hope to have like a roundtable discussion with myself, maybe Tark Lacour because he's a crazy determinist, and one or two others from different perspectives in the near future. So, so um, I'd try to get that one sorted uh, as soon as possible. But yeah, but yeah, even, but even I kind of noticed like when it comes to say these prophecies. Um, at least the biblical prophecies, because like um, there's there's a lot of like uh, mental gymnastics about these. Yes, like um, even like hardcore Calvinists would argue sometimes God go- does give prophecies that will not happen uh, because they're a secondary means and like they're still contingent. You know, they have this kind of unusual way. But like even presenting from like the nature of prophecy, um, these texts are rather explicit that these are not spiritual sacrifices merely. There is like a spiritual element to all sacrifice, of course. You know. Uh, it's also seems like you kill an animal and it's automatic. You know, there's more. You have to have a broken heart and contrite spirit. Hosea, Rael, and that, that's what a lot of people will proof text from the psalm that says, I will not accept your sacrifices. I want the broken heart and contrite spirit. But when, if you keep reading, he says, then I will accept your offerings unto me. Yeah. And, so also, it, it was, and also like Christ's, what Christ did was a sacrifice as well. And that was the ultimate sacrifice. So. Again, there's problems like absolutizing those texts from Psalms and Hosea. They're going against a very strict legalistic um, idea like sacrifice, uh, you just do the sacrifice and you're good. No, you have, it has to be informed by uh, love and kindness and so forth, you know, um, so... It's but, just it's just like baptism. Baptism is more than just getting wet and going through the ordinance. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, point to bring up. But like these are very literal sacrifices and many of them are not dealing with like say some you could argue like say the first come in and then they could be spiritualized or like whatever even if that's very difficult many of these are clearly eschatological that he's dealing with the second coming um and they're so graphic and so literal you have to engage in a lot of gymnastics to answer them away to give you one example when it comes to ezekiel's prophecy um not all catholics are like this but like ambrose and milan who uh, was all millennial uh, he basically argued that the temple was basically uh mary and the gate that opens and shuts refers to her uh, virginal, uh, perpetual virginity uh, status, if you will. And the prince that enters, you no, know, because the prince enters and the gate shuts, you know, no one else enters. That's a illusion or like a type of Christ and how she's, Christ is the only biological son of Mary while remaining physically a virgin. Um, yeah. Which I don't, which, uh, which I don't think anyone you know who knows how to engage in grammatical exegesis would argue for, in regards to your Mariology or eschatology, you know. Um, I, I, I liked how you one time you you found a gem where a, a Lutheran scholar admitted that is it the text in in Matthew yeah. that talk that that talks about they didn't know her until yeah. they had the child, and and she she kind of had to admit that this text does contradict the tradition and we should change the text to fit the tradition, I think was yeah. what her solution was. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, and this Lutheran scholar, of course, holds you perpetual version. He has the Luther, uh, but she basically argued as it stands, the Greek text man, one twenty five in all the textual traditions. Um, uh, yeah. The hey, yes, who are the until refers to a termination. They did engage in sexual intercourse once the until was reached. So this, but you know, uh, so it just means like uh, we have to like uh, re-restore the text and like this kind of hypothetical original text that's been lost. Um, okay, w- 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 which is crazy, but like uh, at least she had the uh, intellectual honesty admit like how it stands, even with, like say the Codex Vaticanus uh, just having hey, it's not hey, it's it it's a blow against perpetual virginity. <laughs> But, okay yeah <laughs> so so you mentioned that the prince going in through the gate and we're and this is going back to ezekiel f- chapters 40 through 46 and that's actually um that goes back a little bit earlier i think in ezekiel also what what are your thoughts on e- ezekiel's prince the prince david do you think that's referring to christ in context or do you do you do you think there's something to the davidic servant ideas for that yeah <sighs> It could have like a dual fulfillment with Christ, uh, but at the same time, I do believe Joseph Smith did teach like a there would be a future David figure, um, 
an eschatological figure and it could refer to this. Um, I know Avraham Gilady kind of got into trouble by kind of going a bit overboard, unfortunately, although I don't think he should have ever been excommunicated. Um, that was a sham. But like, I know he's taught that. And like, I do think like uh, it may refer to like, say, an eschatological Davidic figure who is like a temporal physical savior of sorts. Um, okay. No, it could have like a a partial fulfillment in the first advent of Christ and the second sometime thereafter through like a servant figure as well. So, but if push comes to shove, like if it's a single figure, I say it would be a end times Davidic figure. Okay. Yeah. Because, because I know you don't pull punches. You, when you think something that, um, if you think, you know, later Latter-day Saints have kind of interpreted the Bible wrong, you will, be, I've got you, into trouble about that, but yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like that you have your honest opinion. So, and you just refer you referenced Joseph Smith's, I believe that was his March tenth, eighteen forty four discourse on priesthood, where he actually talked about King David, and he, it's interesting as he mentions David held the priesthood, which is something you have actually talked a lot on your blog about, and then he goes on to say, so he said this is the full statement. Although David was a king, he never did obtain the spirit and power of Elijah and the fullness of the priesthood and the priesthood that he did receive and the throne and kingdom of David is to be taken from him and given to another by the name of David in the last days raised up out of his lineage. So Joseph Smith did seem to have a, um, you know, think that there would be a latter day David figure and some sources indicate he might have even thought that his son could potentially have been the his unborn son, David Hiram Smith, could have potentially been that if he had been faithful and worthy, obviously, right? Which he wasn't, so. which he wasn't because he joined with his apostate brother in, uh, with the or LDS. But um, yeah. <laughs> he, 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 he lost his sanity, unfortunately, when he came out to Utah. And um, Joseph III tried to blame it on the participating in a mass alignment's seances because the last a mass alignment apostatized and became a godbeite and they were spiritualists doing trying to communicate with spirits and he tried to blame it on that is how joseph the third tried to reconcile david hiram smith losing his sanity um but it seems to also coincide about the time he's also talking to all of his father's plural wives and realizing that yes my dad was a polygamist the evidence is too overwhelming and he, he even writes letters at that time admitting that, you know, he says, I hope I don't lose your friendship for admitting that my dad definitely was involved with this stuff. And so I think that maybe it could have been a bit of both that contributed. You know, we don't really know what caused him to have his mental illness and, uh, and, and, and for those listening, there's a very good biography. Of, um, I forgot the author, but it was called From Mission to Madness, which is a biography about David Hiram Smith for those who are um, interested in like uh, this uh, figure of the uh, restoration. Um, okay, so that's a scriptural basis. So, like, there is like a scriptural basis that, in some way or another, there will be literal animal sacrifices, at least at the end times, in the middle of the just thereabouts. But this kind of uh, raises the question, though: What these Hebrews and the other scriptures, both uniquely Latter Day Saint and biblical teaching, with respect to Christ's atonement? You know, um, so maybe I should ask, like, what is the common understanding of the atonement amongst many people? in the U.S. and elsewhere that Latter day Saints hold to, and why is it wrong? <laughs> so a lot of people have a view of the atonement that God was going to basically punish all of his children by, um, you know, you know, he, he's just going to inflict capital punishment on everyone for their sins because of, you know, he cannot tolerate sin, and he's just so full of wrath over sin that he was going to punish all of us for it. But fortunately, there was one good son, Jesus Christ, and he basically volunteered because he was perfect and sinless. And, you know, he, he and so he took upon him the punishment for everyone else in that regards where, you know, we all were going to face the wrath of God and the wrath of God instead got inflicted on um, Jesus Christ for everyone else is kind of and that's the, the penal view of the atonement I, I think there's a specific form of the, yeah penal the penal. substitution yeah, yeah. and it, it's really common amongst calvinist circles in their view as you touched upon in their view the, the legal punishment which was like eternal conscious torment 
uh, that was imputed to the body of Christ, and Christ was the legal um, substitute. So he suffered eternal wrath in hell. And Calvin actually believed when uh, Jesus was suffering in Gethsemane that he was suffering the eternal uh, pains of hell. And you see this in his commentary on Hebrews 5, I think verse 7, in his um, multi-volume commentary. Uh, and some interpreted like the descent into hell, or descent at Infernus in First Peter 3, <laughs> As not Hades, where like um, a more neutral term that Christ actually went literally to hell. <laughs> I, I was just about to ask you that if there were actually some Protestant yeah, Cal- and Calvinists, uh, yeah, so, saying that, some that, some that actually, Jesus so, actually went to hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah he didn't, and not like hell, like in King James hell that could refer to Hades or Sheol. This was hell, hell, you know, um, you know, saying in these pitchforks, um, you know, that type of hell. <laughs> get, get, get Gehenna and not spirit prison. Yeah, exactly, but even uh so and i stress like legal because this refers to like the calvinist understanding what justification is and that's where you're legally declared just but you're not changed you're still it's basically simul justus et pectator uh, i'm probably butchering the latin pronunciation at the same time righteous legally but sinful intrinsically uh the although i don't think luther came up with this like it does for this theology intrinsically you're a ball of dung you know but you're covered but not changed by snow and that's the analogy you're intrinsically evil you're a god hater but now you're in this legal category where you're covered but not changed by christ's righteousness in justification the change is sanctification only i i i I like there's so many jokes you can make about the people who who really sincerely believe that that you can go on being a, a wicked terrible person that you know that you are just you know, imputed, you know, the imputed righteousness jokes. And somebody, so there, there was a certain uh, anti-Mormon who wanted somebody to take over his Facebook page. And, and you know, he said, I want another um, Calvin, I think whatever kind of you know, Calvinist to, to take over this page. And he says, well, and one of the Latter-day Saints goes, well, can't I be imputed as a Calvinist, even though I'm not actually a Calvinist to take over your page? <laughs> yeah, or like my favorite is like um, by the same person, like um, imputation explained. This is a red pen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that's, and it's actually this model of atonement. And by the way, if anyone wants a critique of it, um, look up my review of Terrell Givens's book, The Christ Who... Um, the Christ who heals. It's called a critique of the Christ who heals. Givens himself rejects penal substitution, but I address penal substitution and other theories of atonement in that review. Um, so if you want my okay. take on that. As well, another and a bit against imputed righteousness as well. Um, but be that as me, that's a very common uh, notion, Protestant notion of the atonement, and it seems like it's been picked up uh, by Latter-day Saints. Um, in the book, the, the Infinite Atonement, I'm not. I'm sure you've heard of it. I'm not sure if you read it, but he basically, tries uh, to defend, to yeah, he he basically tries to defend double jeopardy in a footnote. You know, um, he basically says it's not unjust that Christ paid in a forensic legal way for our sins, but you could still pay for them if you reject him. You know, he kind of recognizes the double jeopardy argument, but he says it's not actually. Uh, immoral or wrong, but unfortunately, he doesn't really address why it's not. There is a double jeopardy. Um, problem here so and in your book uh, in your book uh, on theology you address uh, using the bible and even patristics and medievals as evidence um so shout out to errol ami for a positive influence on you yep. um very, yeah, very I, I have to give a lot of credit to errol for um all the great stuff with patristics that he has yeah, in- introduced yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, i'm grateful that he introduced me to david Brousseau's works first by just linking those videos over and over again in the different debates between Mormons and non-Mormons. He's like, why don't you guys check out what the early Christians thought about this or that or the other? And one of those videos I really appreciated was David Bursow's what the early Christians believed about the atonement. And one of the things that Bursow pointed out that was just mind-blowing was this idea of penal substitution wasn't around in the early days of Christianity, that it was a very late addition to Catholic theology um, about the 11th century was when that idea starts to um, come up. And, and so I, I was, I found that very fascinating, very compelling that the early Christians took a more uh, holistic view of the atonement where the atonement or an encompassing view where they focus more on that. We are changed through spiritual union with Jesus Christ, that it is about 
transformative, uh, you know, transforming us from our fallen wicked nature to being a more holy nature. And that's what Christ's atonement was for. He did die for us. You know, it was, this, it was a sacrificial um, event. You know, it was, there was a great sacrifice and that the whole purpose, but the whole purpose of it was to change us and not just to um, be a ball of dung and have um, uh, whatever, whatever analogy you use about being covered up with something, a, a chocolate, I guess. Choc- chocolate covering the ball of dung or whatever. Oh, ball of dung and snow. Um, it, oh, snow. Yeah. But so, how does it change us? How how does the atonement actually change us? Um, of course, like there's baptism, there's ordinances. How, what's the relationship between the atonement and like a broken heart, new spirit, and the ordinances such as baptism? You know. Yeah, I think the ordinances were really, in, you know, the, the, and the ordinances play a big part. They are efficacious, and that baptism is um, about that symbolically dying to your sins and your former life and you know with christ and it's about entering into that spiritual union with jesus christ and um i I really and and that's what um i talk a little bit about this david Brousseau talks about the, the early christians um really um saw the sacrament as efficacious that it wasn't just a a symbol but that it was about you know having this um connection with jesus christ and and through you know and that's and and i actually argue that um, in my paper that you know how can uh spiritual real presence fit with latter-day saint theology and i argue from uh moroni in the, the the sacramental prayers talk about you know that you're praying for christ's spirit to be with you and um in, in other verse, in there's statements from Brigham Young and others about how important the sacrament was, and, and the proper worthiness to while, while partaking of it. So, um, yeah. So, so my big hang up. I really like David Bursow's lecture on the the atonement, but I was like, how do I fit this with Latter Day Saint um, theology, and how do I fit this with you know what appears to be penal substitution verses that. You know, verses in the Book of Mormon that appear to support penal substitution. There's several different scholars who are much greater thinkers on and have put a lot more effort into studying the atonement than I have. Um, I, I cite um, Blake Blake Ostler's atonement theology. I think he's is his model is very good in, in talking about that. Um, he, I think he calls his the compassion model. Is that what the name of it? It's been a long time yeah, since yeah, I've been... Com- yeah. Compassion to your atonement, and uh, for those who want an explication of Blake's view, volume two of his book, um, book series, The Export and Mormon Talk, The Problems of Theism and the Love of God. Um, funny story, last time I was in Utah, I had lunch with Blake, uh, albeit with a uh, broken wisdom tooth, so it was up to my eyeballs and painkillers, and we were mis- <laughs> we were debating our various uh, theories of atonement and propitiation, so fun time. Yeah. So yeah. So 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 Blake Blake's model is really good, and I also I, I know you 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 don't really like it that much. I personally like Cleon Skousen's take on at least his way of of looking at um what what does he call his model? I'm trying to remember. It's is not it called the. the one? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well. He tries to say that Christ's um, suffering was to appease all of our. Intelli- you know all the intelligences in this creation and overwhelm his is also was kind of a compassion model where it was to overwhelm them with a feeling of needing justice and vengeance to overwhelm them with a desire for mercy and compassion seeing what Christ had to deal with, go through for all of us and what he did you know even though he was perfect and he didn't need to suffer what he suffered through and so uh, um, Cleon, I, I personally really like Cleon Skousen's model. I like the um, David Berceau lays out the ransom model of the atonement, where he says early Christians took a very um, view that it's from it, it, it the the sacrifice was uh, ransom to free us from Satan. It's kind of I think he takes it too literally. Personally, I like the ransom model. I don't think that there was a literal you know, pay, you know that Christ's death was a literal payment to Satan. I think well, that it was. Yeah, and that, that was something like Origen himself actually. Um, it wasn't his only view, but that was a view Origen held. The analogy would be like um, the cross was like the fishing bait, you know, and God um, wants to fish. You're saying God got whole like a yank, you know. Um, so. That, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it would be taking the metaphor too literally. 
Yeah. So, so, so I think Berceau kind of takes the metaphors too, too literally, but he does make the good point that the emphasis was on changing our nature. So that's the purpose of the, that's what the classic model of the atonement was, where you can almost say it's kind of a, a, a moral improvement perspective is part of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, yeah, there's a moral exemplar theory of atonement. Um, and, and that was kind of yeah, and, and, and some like uh, radical re- reformation groups as well, like the Sassanians, they held to a, um, albeit they didn't really hold like say a um, sacrificial and shining Christ atonement, but they did understand like his life and death to be a moral exemplar. So they were, uh, although they were a bit raw in many respects, at least they got that aspect in their teaching uh, correct as well. And some other groups do hold like say some type of um, moral exemplar theory of atonement as well. So it's it's common, even if it's a minority view at times. Yes. Yeah, so, so the big thing that I, I like that David Rousseau pointed out was that in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, he argues that, um, you know, that Jesus is teaching the kingdom of heavens like a king who's taking account of his servants and one owes a huge debt, you know, tons and tons of money and the servant couldn't pay it. So the king was going to have him sold. So the payment could be made. The servant fell down and begged him for mercy, saying, have mercy with me and I will pay what I owe. And the king was moved with compassion and forgave him the debt. But then that servant went and found another servant who owed him, you know, te- you know, a little, you know, maybe one, one, one you know, very, very teeny tiny relative amount of money. And he's like, oh, you know, and the other servant asked, you know, for, for the similar mercy he wouldn't give it to him. He said, no, nope, you're going to be thrown into debtor's prison for not being able to pay it back. And the, when the king heard what this servant did to the other servant, he was angry at what he did. And he said, oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired of me. Shouldn't you have also had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I have had pity on you? And so the thing David Brousseau points out was, so, and so the Lord was wroth with him. And likewise, and 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 he, he delivered the wicked, unjust servant over to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due. Jesus then said, "So likewise shall my feather, fa- heavenly Father do also unto you, if you don't forgive others their trespasses." And so Jesus said that was an analogy to the kingdom of heaven. And Berceau points out that you know it's not someone else comes in and pays that debt but the the father is able to forgive you of your, your uh, of what you owe him you know it's not a and and, and Brousseau makes a good point of if god isn't able to forgive us then you know and if he's a perfect being and isn't because he's so perfectly just and he isn't able to forgive us then how could we be justified in um you know forgiving others if that's something that God himself doesn't do. And so he points out that, you know, clearly that parable is to teach that God is capable of forgiveness and that, you know, obviously he wants us to, obviously we need to repent and we need to um, change from our sinful ways in order to be able to inherit the kingdom of heaven. But there isn't like a monetary payment that had to be made for, for that, you know, for that to be able to happen. So I thought that was a good good point that he made in that lecture in yeah, my opinion no, no, i also enjoy that parable because it shows when it comes to say the um the first servant um his future debt or his sins was not actually uh taking care of that conversion you know which is the common penal substitutionary view of justification like at conversion not your just your past and present sins but even your future sins have been forgiven and remitted and appeased uh, so, like anything, any sins you commit afterwards, you know, you might fall under God's fatherly discipline, but you won't lose your salvation because your sins have already been forgiven uh, in that respect. Uh, also, it shows like uh, there is like some kind of a purgation you have to go through, you know, uh, um, you know, when you're in a debtor's prison. So, it's either hell, which would mean you can lose your salvation, or it's some kind of a intermediate state, which is still consistent with our theology, like in section 76, yeah. um, you know, in 1 Corinthians 3. So, no matter how you cut it, like it's very consistent with like a Latter Day Saint soteriology, but very inconsistent when it comes to common Protestant soteriologies. So um, it, that's another uh, interesting aspect of that uh, parable as well. Um, yeah, great stuff. I, I wasn't really prepared to talk too much on the atonement. It was. It's been a couple of years since I. Um, did well, my research but, on that? No, to be fair, you've uh, in your uh, in your work here, you do give an overview, um, and there's a view like of Aberlard and other 
heavy hitters when it comes to uh, teology. It's not some kind of randomer here and there uh, throughout Christian history who rejected these kind of models and affirmed like moral exemplar, maybe even the Christus Victor model and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. and also, like, so, one- so I guess the way the reason I, I tie into that when talking about animal sacrifice is I wanted to get into a deeper view of the atonement where it's not just a simplistic debt paid model that is taught to children so commonly because that just because that's the easiest thing that people can, can teach children, you know, young children about, um, you know, trying to teach them the basics of the atonement, but it's about a deeper thing where it's supposed to be transformative. It's supposed to, you know, change your, you know, nature. And I think the other thing Berceau mentions is that it's ultimately the resurrection is a key part of the, what the early Christians emphasize about the atonement is that Christ brought to pass the fact that we can have eternal life through him and, and through that relationship with him. So it, the, the reason I mentioned that is I'm like, so how, what, what, how would you do our baptism and sin offerings basically for the same purpose was, um, you know, animal sacrifices for sins and baptism, basically just kind of the same thing or similar thing. And based off of, um, and I think your um, the Protestant commentary on Ezekiel's temple touched upon it is that these the the, the sin offerings in the law of Moses were specifically for sinful acts, um, or or not even necessarily like what we would consider sins, but like things that had to deal with uncleanliness or uh, other different ceremonial uncleanliness, right? Uh, sim- similar to how you say what you find in Leviticus twelve and Luke two and Mary's offering, it wasn't like a sin offering, like um that Mary sinned and she had to offer this sacrifice. I'm not like a Mary was sinless in total, but like when it comes to Luke 2, when it speaks of sacrifice Mary offered, it's offering, it's not like a sin offering in the sense like she sinned, but more like um, because of impurity, physical impurity, and as a result, cultic impurity, but not necessarily like sin as in like transgressing God's law. You know, so uh, there's like these, even in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, at least when it comes to say, how it approaches the Old Testament cultists and stuff like that. Uh, there's like the idea, like say, external contagion and internal contagion and other gradients of sin as well and impurity. Um, so, Yeah, and so I would say that's pretty different than what baptism is about. Baptism is a lot more encompassing. It's about the, the change in your fallen nature to, um, you know, to, to taking on the nature of the second Adam, right, is what yeah. the New Testament Bapt- teaches. Baptism regenerates. It's the instrument of regeneration, uh, or the laver of regeneration, as you see in, like, Titus 3. Uh, but sin, no, all the sacrifices in the Old Covenant, even those spoken about that, will be reinstituted in the New, uh, like in, at the Eschaton. They don't regenerate. Uh, it's more like when the realms of maybe sanctification, internal and or external, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so that's kind of why... And so when talking, when you get into the book of Hebrews and it's contrasting the Levitical sacrifices and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So that's what makes Jesus Christ's sacrifice so much more powerful is it was only needed once. It is not something that's continually, sorry, Catholics. Um, (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. You see, it's actually numerically the same sacrifice. It's just like, it's, um, so it's only represented, not re-represented. (laughs) <laughs> you know, while, while while the while the Levitical sacrifices were offered daily, and they didn't have the power to change your sinful nature, the atonement of Jesus Christ was offered once and for all, and to take away you know the sins of all those who, yeah. who choose to accept and, it. And Hebrews uses the term "ephahapax," which doesn't mean like once is like um, and it's ambiguous. Like once could be done again. No, it denotes finality. Once, period, or once for all. As in for all time, never to be repeated again. Um, so it's very strong. okay. Yeah. Okay. So and and so I mentioned that there's a messianic Jew who who has done a lot of sa- study on sacrifice and um, the Mosaic law and um, and how that fits with being a Christian. His name is Avron Yeshua. And he actually did kind of a nice little commentary on the book of Hebrews. And I just want to read a quote from that real quick. 
So the writer of Hebrews did say that the blood of bulls and goats did forgive sins, i.e. the cleansing of the flesh, Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. For all Israel that was defiled, sinful. Again, the writer is comparing the two, the blood of animals for the forgiveness of sin and the blood of Yahshua for the forgiveness of sin. So what is he speaking of in Hebrews 10, 4 and 10, 11 when he's saying that the, the blood of animals and bulls is not doesn't take away sins is what those two verses say it's our sin nature that the blood of animals could not touch only the blood of god the son could transform our nature into his this is what is meant when it states the sacrifice of yahshua was greater than animal sacrifice only his blood could forgive us our sin nature and birth within us a new nature his it's our old carnal adamic nature that the writer of hebrews is speaking of when he says that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't affect it the blood of both bulls and goats could forgive sins but could not give israel a nature like yahshua's only his blood and spirit can do that and that's from a paper <laughs> crap I, I closed it right before i right after reading it that's from a paper he did called Mosaic Sacrifice in the New Testament. And he has a, a website. I, if you Google his name, a Avram Yesh Yehoshua, I guess is how you pronounce it. Mosaic Sacrifice in the New Testament. So, okay. so that's interesting. Uh, before we kind of end things, any, um, any future projects you're working on or any publications people should be out on the outlook for? Um, I've, I've got some stuff that, that I'm, I'm starting to work on. They're still kind of in the preliminary stages of, of um, writing. But um, one thing I am excited to do is in two weeks, there's going to be the first of two debates on, jo you know, on Joseph Smith's polygamy um, to, in response to the growing movement that tries to say that Joseph Smith was, did not practice or teach polygamy in that it was really all fabricated and not trustworthy to believe that he was involved with that. And, you know, you and I have some strong feelings about that historical position. And me and Mark Tensmeyer are, uh, he, so I, I did my paper, Joseph Smith's Polygamy Factor Fiction, which was kind of just a short, you know, introduction to all the different evidence that's out there that Joseph Smith indeed definitely practiced and taught polygamy. And Mark Tinsmeyer is actually working on a paper to be included in a new volume done by Signature Books, where he is going, he, he's put a lot of effort into studying all the different um, polygamy deniers' arguments, and he understands them well enough to rebuttal what they say very, really comprehensively. He could honestly write a, a really long book on it if he really wanted to, but he says he's not sure if he's going to actually do a long book, but he is at least going to get a paper published in, in an upcoming volume by Signature Books on that. And so in, we're going to be debating two individuals who I understand are in the Denver snuffer camp. And so the first debate is in two weeks on, um, that's August 6th, or it's either August 6th or August 7th. I'd have to double check and that's it, it is being hosted by a polygamy denier youtube channel so we'll, we'll have to hope the moderation is is fair and balanced and so uh just had technical just had technical difficulty uh so the, the debate will be held by a uh, polygamy denier uh youtube page yeah hemlock knots is the name of that the 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 website and they are obviously have a that they have they have a bias so but we're hoping you know both me and mark are very well researched on this topic topic and we do think it's an important debate to have i i recently saw in midnight mormons where they've been um having back and forth dialogue regarding that um who killed joseph smith pseudo historical movie that yeah. pretends pretending to be a documentary biggest load of bs i've ever seen in my life but yeah <laughs> but like a lot of people in the comments of, of those of those discussions on Midnight Mormons, like we want to actually see a, a solid debate between the evidence that Joseph Smith was a polygamist versus the arguments that he wasn't. And um, I'm really excited to have that debate out there. I think that's going to be very important for a lot of people to actually see that conversation. So yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear it about the debate because uh, even when it comes to say nutty positions, and I do think like the idea that Joseph was a monogamist to, to be very ahistorical i'll put it nicely i do believe sunshine is the best disinfectant so like all when it comes to your side of things you just have to present the 
historical evidence from like his plural wives and all the documentation. The the most they have is like uh, DNC one hundred and one from like the eighteen thirty five. Uh, and some polygamy, what seems to be polygamy denials from Joseph, but um, that that seems to be like a, a lot of where the bulk of the evidence um, for the con side comes from. Um, but yeah, 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 they're 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 very short on on evidence, and it's you know kind of the same song, you know, different tune over and over again. So we'll we'll just have to see how it goes. But I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, it's like um, I had him on like uh, last week. Um, I hope to have a debate with him about modalism because he's group holds to that perspective but um adam stokes he's an apostle and elder in one of the elijah message churches and they would hold the view joseph was not a polygamist interesting i didn't know that yeah he told me he'll uh, be talking to like some of the leaders of the church about section one, what he's now section 132 in the lds uh, doctrine of covenants um because it, yeah i think he seems to recognize it does come from joseph so like uh, how to screw this but i think he's a uh, fan of the uh, prices uh, tree volume work uh, joseph smith fall polygamy which I'm sure uh, I'm yeah. Sure. yeah, yep. That that's that that's kind of the one that kind of gave the polygamy denial movement a, a new life, really, because um, it started off as you know it was it was mostly Joseph the Third who who started off because most of the people in the 1840s and 1850s knew that Joseph had done polygamy. Both the Brighamites and all the other branches knew it, but because you know Emma didn't like it. And Joseph the Third felt he needed to defend his father. He said, "You know, I am need to defend my father's name, and uh, my father was a good man, and a good man wouldn't have practiced polygamy in in his view." So that's kind of how it started. But as the R uh, LDS Church grew and developed, and actually kind of looked at the history, they're like, "This isn't really supportable." And eventually, they had to, you know abandoned it and they also abandoned it about the time that church went very liberal on many other topics yeah it's like and, they, they abandoned something uh wrong that's good but unfortunately they embraced loads of wrong things like gay marriage and female ordination and rejecting book of mormon historicity so it's like one step forward like hundreds, <laughs> hundreds back you know so so the the prices i understand are part of kind of the different rlds um one more conservative of ones that take joseph smith seriously even if they're wrong he's interpreting you know um you know they, they unlike to say the community of christ and uh the president of the church they actually think joseph told the truth <laughs> yeah that, that, that's, how, um, that's how it characterized the modern uh, community of christ uh, we're embarrassed about joseph and we want to be liberal protestants Yep, yep. They, they they say that Joseph was being spiritually abusive in in practicing plural marriage, or like when the they, or, or like he had a spiritual experience in eighteen twenty. <laughs> um, it, so so just to plug a good book. So like I said, I actually have my paper, Joseph Smith's Polygamy: Fact or Fiction. I have that available as a free download because I I think that that's a uh, on oneeternalround.org. For anyone who wants to download that paper to look and through, because I, uh, I'll include the URL to One Eternal Round on the uh, show notes, so everyone can access that. And that is really just kind of a short, short paper, uh, but it's one of the longer issues of One Eternal Round. I just wanted to cover a lot of the compelling non-Brighamite evidence that Joseph Smith taught and practiced polygamy. And if you want a much longer take, I think you and I both would recommend. Um, you just had him on your show recently, Brian Hale's three-volume work on Joseph Smith's polygamy. I think that is really well done. Yeah, and, and also he, MormonPolygamyDocuments.org for like all the primary and secondary uh, sources, either scans or transcriptions. So, yeah, yeah, that's an excellent resource. Yeah. So, so no, uh, all the best with the debate. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be participating in a few debates in the near future when I'm back in Utah on the Mac conception, uh, solar scripture, baptism, and maybe one. And of course, I have the uh, dialogue debate on modalism with uh, Adam. So that's going to be very interesting. Because, yeah, uh, that, that's going to be. Because usually when it comes to say Joseph was a modalist in the Book of Mormon and the 1832 account of the First Vision teaches modalism, that comes from critics usually like Grant Palmer and Dan Vogel. What's different though is like, unlike Vogel and Palmer, I'm actually going to be debating someone who actually believes in Book of Mormon historicity and Joseph was a prophet. So it's going to be okay. so discussing the reception history and like the other accounts of the First Vision. Uh, that's going to be uh, really interesting as well from a different perspective as well so yeah that, that'll be really interesting yeah it's fun well uh, jacob i do greatly appreciate your time and hopefully this will be a very good um resource for those who want to like um know what some of the issues are what are the scriptural texts and other topics to uh, keep in mind when addressing this particular issue that unfortunately has been understudied um in many circles so um and i said like um 
uh, part one and two of the Restoration of Adamic Ordinances. It's uh, issues number 13 and 14 of uh, One Eternal Round, um, for those who want a more in-depth discussion. Um, so, again, uh, greatly appreciate your time, and um, hopefully we can have you on in the future to discuss other issues as well. Yep, thanks for having me on, Robert. My pleasure. Have a great day.